And now, Deborah Cobalt Live. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on Deborah Cobalt Live. I have a terrific show today, and I've got three guests. We're going to be talking about the People's Pottery Project. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for Deborah. having us. Now, let me introduce each of you. We've got uh, Molly Larkey. You are the co-founder of People's Pottery Project. We also have uh, Lauren Fuller. Raise your hand so we know who you are. There's Lauren. Um, <laughs> And we also have Susan Bustamante. Um, both Lauren and Susan are formerly incarcerated um, people. Lauren, uh, you were in prison, I think, what, 17 years. Isn't that correct? Yes, ma'am. Wow. And Susan, um, how many years? 31, 31 years you served? That blows my mind, Susan. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining us. And people are probably saying, well, what's the connection between them and People's Pottery Project? And for that, I'm going to go now to Molly, the founder. Tell us what is People's Pottery Project, please. Thanks, Deborah, for having us. Um, so I started People's Pottery Project um, a little less than two years ago. I had been volunteering with California Coalition for Women Prisoners for about five years. And during that process, I learned that most of the people who are in prison are not actually who mm -hmm. DAs or people who say tough on crime uh, would or may make want us to believe are in prison. So there's a lot of people in prison who are sentenced under um, guidelines that put them in prison for things that they didn't do, harms they didn't commit. So that is sort of the background. I also learned from being a member of this um, mutual aid organization called California Coalition for Women Prisoners about the difficulties that people, when they were released, um, especially women, trans, and um, non-binary, formerly incarcerated people, the immense, almost impossible challenges that people face once they do get out, you know, after having had this, you know, tremendously difficult and traumatic experience of being incarcerated, um, then the, the hurdles to actually rebuilding a life are so, so steep. And um, because I'm a visual artist, um, I always wanted to find ways to use my skill set and my connections and just my belief in the um in the power of creativity and the power of um sharing resources to use to help both people who are coming out and then by extension you know people who are still incarcerated um with these sentences that are you know um so so unfair and so cruel so um that's how I started it. And the way that it works is that um, we're a collective of me and a couple other allies and all everyone else is formerly incarcerated. Um, and people come to class uh, where we had classes before the pandemic where they would come make ceramics and get paid for their time. And it would serve as kind of also a place for people to get together and share information about how they're navigating some of the difficulties. You know, people would come in and be homeless at the time or not have a car or not able to get their driver's license or, you know, just, just stuff that we take for granted. And so we were able to kind of, as a group, help each other um, solve some of these problems. And then um, the goal is really for the business and is we're, we're well on our way to, to achieving that goal is run entirely by the formerly incarcerated members. So they're making pottery that we sell. Um, it's gorgeous. We, um, we we're doing really well with that, but we, we definitely want to, you know, let more people know about the pottery that we, that we make. It's very beautiful. And so through the sale of the pottery, we, um, we fund the activities and, and, um, you know, also just help people know more about, um, our members. And um, so that's, that's, that's where we're at with, with the People's Pottery Project. Susan, 31 years behind bars. Yes. When you were released, how many years ago were you released? Uh, two and a half, September of 2018. That must have been a very daunting moment because as you walk out into freedom, you must have been thinking what? It was scary going into the Sally Port because we knew that um, going into the Sally Port is a ride up and an escape. So it took uh -huh. a minute to get through the Sally Port and out on the other side. And I saw my family and friends across the street, even though I didn't get to see them immediately, 
um, I was on the other side. I was never supposed <laughs> to ever be on the other side of that fence. <laughs> right. And Lauren, uh, you were just released this past year. Isn't that correct? Yes. Three months ago. What's especially stunning about your story, Lauren, is that when you entered prison, you entered as Lawrence, correct? And you transitioned while you were in prison, which is truly extraordinary. Yes, that is true. Uh, I would have thought that that would have been very difficult for you, no? Um, just how you were accepted and um, in, in the prison system. But they made it fairly. Could you explain the experience you had with that? Well, it, it was very hard at first, you know, because, you know, dealing with my peers and, like you said, what other people thought of me and the reputation that I was perceived by other people. It, so it was very difficult for me at first. But once I found my strength to become myself, who I felt all my life, I've never felt any, much better in my life, you know, just being able to be myself. So It's, it's yeah. extraordinary to get the guts to do that, uh, Lauren, yeah. particular in a prison system when you know it could be pretty rough right yes yes i can yeah but you did it you should be very okay. proud of yourself it's pretty extraordinary susan so then how did you happen you you said you were released it was freedom you could taste the fresh air you could smell it your family was across the street what was going on in your mind like now what do i do or, or what happened and then how did you end up finding people's pottery project i was uh, picked up by a Pro, uh, program mm. and so I had to go directly with them and um, they just drove off they were very rude didn't even let me see my family yeah. but um, I did see them directly at uh, my agent my parole agent's office and they met me there and one of the first things they did was hand me a dollar because we can't touch <laughs> money <laughs> so they handed me a dollar. We've said, we've gotten your water for 31 years. Get it yourself. So I actually had to put money in a vending machine, and it was a trip. Wow. <laughs> then I was handed but how a did... cell phone. <laughs> then you were handed a cell phone. Oh, yeah. wow. Like, so oh. when you were finally released from that transition program, you went to go live with family, right? My daughter, yeah, my oldest daughter. You're your daughter. And are you still with her now? Yes. Oh, I'll That's... stay with her. Oh, I'm sure after all this time, I'm sure she wants you to stay with her for eternity, right? I can't imagine. <laughs> well, it's kind of hard because I was away 31 years. So we're having, I was not, I was a mom inside, but it's a different mentality than the child out here that has grown into a 40 year old, 40 plus year old adult. You know, so it's a transition. It really is, but we're working on it and uh, we're okay. Yeah. Um, so how did you find people's pottery project? How And, and what do you do when you go and visit there? Do you, and, and I know now you really can't with COVID or I think you guys are doing work in an outside environment, but when you first started going there, what were you thinking? What were you hoping for? Well, the other two um, co-workers were friends of mine, and they live really close to me, and they know I don't drive. So they said, hey, do you want to go do this? And at first I was hesitant because I don't, I'm not artistic, but I'm like, okay, let me go try. And I mm. work part-time because I help watch my great-grandson. But um, yeah, we, in fact, I'm going back Monday. I got a touch of COVID in for Christmas present. So oh. I'm healthy <laughs> enough to go back Monday. <laughs> oh, good for you. Oh, that must have been difficult to top it off, right? But you seem like you're doing okay. You seem yeah. like you're doing okay. Yeah. Oops. Mm -hmm. As you cough a little bit, some residual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lauren, talk to me a little bit about you first went to People's Pottery Project to the point where what are you, did I hear you maybe you're working there? I mean, tell me about that. Uh, yes. Uh, when I first came home I was uh like homeless and everything and I went into transitional housing uh then I got in contact with a, a sponsor from prison that is uh Molly's friend through tag and um uh, they called me and asked me that I want to be a part of the workshop so I oh. came to the workshop a couple of times and that's how I was uh, able to get hired through going through the workshop participating in the workshop 
So then I was uh, hired for a time to work here with the People's Poverty Project. <laughs> That's wonderful. So Molly, obviously you are in touch with the prison systems and right. I mean, because he said that they put you in touch or the transitional people put um, uh, Lauren in touch with you. Right. So how do you, that's how they find out about you particularly, right? Actually, no. Um, uh, Lauren mentioned TAG, which is a uh, transgender um, advocacy group, which is, okay. um, is, is a mutual aid organization like California Coalition for Women Prisoners. So really, we, I don't have any contact with the prison system. It's okay. through these organizations, which is almost entirely volunteers of people I see. who are, have come together to, to provide the support that the state isn't really providing for people who are coming out. Um, so we're like, we don't have any funding, even though we're doing huge anti-recidivism work, you know, preventing people from falling on hard times um, and then being forced, you know, to do something that's going to violate their parole and send them back into prison. So really, um, it's the groups and the people who I've met. I met Susan. Susan's a member of California Coalition for Women Prisoners. So we knew each other and I offered her a job and she was able to come with her neighbors and the other co-founders uh, as, you know, um, but, but I, you know, there's a, a, a kind of network of people who are doing a lot of this support for, for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. So those are the people I'm in contact with. And is it formerly incarcerated women in particular? Yeah, we focus on women and trans and non-binary people because right. um, they're, you know, gender non-conforming and, and women, mm -hmm. um, are, have different kinds of challenges and a lot of the um, work opportunities that other organizations are putting forward are not necessarily designed for the kinds of, like Susan was talking about, like she has family obligations, she has care for her great grandson, like our, the way we're doing it is um, teaching people um, how to make the ceramics and also to run the business, but on their schedule. So that's why, you know, Lauren came and she got paid for the for the first day that she ever came while she started to learn the ceramics. So there, there's, you know, women and and um, non-binary um, or gender non-conforming people are the greatest growing segment of the prison population. And so that but their needs aren't really addressed um, on coming out. And also, isn't it true that women, uh, trans and non-binary people um, very often when they land in prison, um, they were abused, correct? Very often. Yeah. And tell me, tell me about that. Whoever wants to jump in, please. Well, I was, I'll it and then hand it over to, actually, I'll just let Susan talk about it. Yeah. I was a, a child molested from 12 to 18 and then married to my uh, abuser who was a Vietnam vet who back then in the early 70s, and you didn't know about PTSD from the war. So that was bad. And right. um, the crime happened and he died. Right. That's a lot, Susan. And, you know, mm -hmm. so you spent a lifetime of, of ab being abused. Yes. And then you end up getting punished for it uh, for 31 years behind bars, which is extraordinary though. when I look at you and when I've talked to you, because I've also talked to you on the phone, you're incredibly resilient and I could see and just hear um, from talking to you that just being around your family and also all the work at People's Pottery Project has given you a lot of hope, hasn't it? Well, the thing is you asked, uh, how did we do it? You know, how did we do yeah. that many years? And I could honestly say in the beginning that that wasn't as bad as what I had previously lived. So oh. with that, I decided to make myself the best person I could be because I had lost so much. I had lost myself. So in working on myself, it helped. And then um, with Molly, there's some place I can have some self-esteem as far as going and earning some money and earning a craft and participating with the people that are really love. They're just great <laughs> people. It's a great group we have. And <laughs> because we all understand you know oh, there's yeah. no judgment and it's that we're so cohesive together and it's just builds your self-esteem even though i'm in like the california coalition women prisoners and and other things this just builds me up 
Lauren, you were laughing. In fact, you're always <laughs> laughing. You've got a great smile. <laughs> Thank um, you. You really do. Uh, <laughs> tell me why you were, were laughing when you were hearing Susan, because in other words, I think that was more of an agreement, right? You better believe yes. it kind of a thing, right? <laughs> Yes, it's, it's like because we're all a family here, and like Molly said, we help each other. Like no matter what we're going through, uh, we can call on each other and give each other advice or whatever, you know. And it's just it's just a great like atmosphere here, you know. It's we're family, you know. We're really family. What was, what was it like for you when you were in prison? Again, you entered as Lawrence. Was it a community that it was at least were you accepting of one another, including in? in in both facilities where you served, um, do you find actually whoever wants to step in, are the prisoners accepting of one another? Because those of us on the outside hear all kinds of stories about what it's like in there. But can you both um, sort of speak to that? And we'll start with you, Lauren. Okay. Well, well, with me, it's uh, it's all depend on the group of people. You know, uh, being a transgender, we have some people that accept us, some people don't. We have uh, people that don't agree with our lifestyles or, you know, I'm, I'm Lauren and don't refer to me as her and want to keep referring me as him. And sometimes, you know, to be nice, I'll just tell him my name is Lauren. You know, if you don't want to call me that, it's fine. Then you have, uh, you know, like I say, groups of people that are just totally disrespectful. And I think in the end too, where I, where I came from, it all depends on you, your personality, yeah. you know, and your reputation. So some somebody else might have had it way more difficult than I did, you know. So it's, mm -hmm. it's it's really like an individual base thing where I came from. Yeah, but that's interesting. They had a transitional, if you will, facility right within the yeah. prison system, so you could transition there. Yes, but it's still it's still you know technically a man's facility, so you still have right. regular guys there that's housed there, and you know that's where the problems come in sometimes. Yeah. But you were strong. Look at you. You <laughs> yeah. were strong. And there's that smile, Lauren. Um, <laughs> Susan, when you were in there, did you find that the collection of, of women that you were with, uh, were you were all accepting of one another in terms of what you had been through? Or was it just a really tough go every day or a little of everything? For the most part, it was uh, smooth sailing. Because really? of the fact that I was a lifer, you know, even though I had life without, um, we went to groups. And so in the groups is a lot of lifers, you know, so you get your little community. I lived with 31 years, you know, yeah. so we bonded and um, it, it, it started in County, you know, there's the, the drug addicts that I befriended them because I didn't judge them, you know, even though I didn't yeah. get into the drugs with them. I, they still trusted me, you know, and I, in CIW, I became a mentor, you know, the longer I was there, the longer I could mentor the younger people. So I even had young 20 year olds that come and talk to me. Wanted, Are you both? Go ahead, Molly, please. Well, I wanted to, some of the things might not, the general audience might not totally understand. So um, Susan, you know, one of the things I spoke about in the beginning of people who are incarcerated for harms that they didn't commit, um, Susan was, um, was incarcerated uh, with a life without the possibility of parole sentence, which is different from life, you know, with a life sentence. And so what she was saying is she was a lifer is, you know, the average age of someone who's sentenced to life without the possibility of parole is 19 years old. And so... Oh. So, um, and the majority are, the wide majority are under 25. So these are people, young people who are given a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. They can't do any of the improvement activities that people who even have a life sentence, but who can go before the parole board with the possibility of shortening their sentence. So it's an extreme, extreme sentence that Susan had, and she would never have gotten out if she hadn't gotten a commutation from the governor. Um, and it's, you know, we call it, um, death by incarceration, um, because it's really a death sentence. You know, they're told you will never have the possibility to leave this place, you're gonna die here. And, you know, part of what our coalition does is really try to bring attention to these, these matters because these are our citizens, you know, these are people who are our families and who are put to die behind bars. And um, so, you know, part of our mission besides supporting the people who, you know, we can only support a few people, you know, right. right have four people who work for the Pottery Project. 
there's thousands of people who are inside who never who like, you know, there's another aspect I want to touch on briefly. There's a rule called felony murder rule where if someone is um, involved or present for the murder of a felony that or that um, someone gets murdered, they go to prison for the whole, for the crime of murder, even if they didn't do anything yeah. to cause the murder. And that was Lauren's situation, correct? That's yes. Lauren's situation. Yeah. And so, so these, these are people who never harmed anyone, um, but they're in prison for life or life without the possibility of parole. And I think most people don't know that and they don't understand that. They think that, you know, there's these violent, violent people who are in prison. And really there's a lot of people who don't, who have no reason to be there, you know, for these extreme sentences and just, you know, 19 years old, like just put away for life, never given an opportunity to, to, um, to even come to improve themselves and go before the parole board. So, and that that was my situation. I was I went in at nineteen, and I wasn't an LWAP, but I was a lifer. And being there, I was a you know we put on different levels. I started off on a level four, which is the maximum level, and I was not allowed to go to like uh, 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 vocational trainings or like oh. any anything to better myself for years. Like I went to court. And I came home three months ago. I've been down 17 years. I was just maybe a year ago able to go to vocationals. And I've been in the prison all that time. And I was not allowed because of having that life over my head. So I wasn't um, able to approve myself like I wanted to and I should have more, you know. You know, this system of, of uh, putting people away and locking the key. How do we even begin to change this? Um, Lauren, Susan, whoever wants to jump in first, please. I'll jump in. Well, and then Susan, I know Susan wants to say, well, Susan, you go ahead. Go ahead. Well, go you on. know, I think that, you know, some of the organizations I talk about were, there's something called the Sentencing Project. Um, there's also, Susan's a leader in the Drop LWAP um, movement, which is to, to, to let, to not have a sentence say, you're going to go to life forever. There's, there's movements to change the legislation and the sentencing. A lot of this stuff came, come, if you ever hear tough on crime, it means that they're trying to throw people away without any hope, you know, and, um, and so, um, and they want you to believe that, that everyone who's, who they're talking about is, is a violent person. It's just not the case. So there's, 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 there's people, you know, I consider myself part of the abolition, com you know, community and, um, you know, with the idea that 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 the prisons aren't really solving our problems, they're not preventing harm. They're really just perpetuating the way that people are harmed. You know, by the state instead of by, if that makes sense. You know, we really don't think that that um, the way the prison system is now is is really solving our our social uh, societal problems. But Susan, please to go ahead no, too. No, I was please address that thing. and that you have. Uh, we have all these groups. Did you need to say something? We have all these groups out here that, that are very supportive. We have uh, Gascon who just came into office that are that's willing to address this mass incarceration, these um, added enhancements for mm -hmm. something you did 25 years ago, you get it added five years just because, just because, you know, and the more they keep, the more they shove in, the more money they get for the unions of the police and they have a tremendous power up in Sacramento. So mm -hmm. it's a no win. And inside you have so many staff that don't see something. They turn their head if, you know, and they walk. I ha there was a fight in our hallway that lasted at least 15 minutes with about 25 women. And finally, when they broke it up, the staff is like, oh, clear the holes. You know, and it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's terribly sad. Lauren, go ahead. Oh no, I was just like agreeing with because I've seen things like that too. They turn their heads when something happens, you know. I would just think that regardless of what a person is in for, rehabilitation should be day one. Exactly. Don't you think? Exactly. Day one. Mm -hmm. And 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 there should be a system where we, you know, they can relook at every single case. Um and none of that really happens. Molly, how do you speak to that? I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, we're talking about human people, human beings. I mean, human I beings. Yeah. Like, we're not talking about people who are different from us. You know, we're talking about no. people who have had challenges, 
and um, you know, ended up in the system. It's well known as people who are black and brown, you know, indigenous people of color. And, you know, um, and so I, you said it best, you know, we should be talking about what people need. That's why our slogan is care, not cages. The movement in general, it's an important idea, you know, is how do we, you know, provide care because everyone who, you know, there's this phrase, um, no one enters violence for the first time by committing it, you know, and I just think about how our world, the society we live in is blaming these individuals for violence that is all around, you know, and the violence that's being committed against them as well. So, um, you know, if we really want to stop having violence in our, in our world, in our community, we have to stop, you know, being violent towards as a, as a, as a country, as a nation, you know, towards these people. Because incarceration is violence. It's violence. People who are listening to this and they want to get involved somehow, where should they start? Where can they start? Um, I mean, by being informed, I don't know, Susan, do you have some ideas? You know, the sentencing project is important. Fuel, uh, families United to Eliminate um, Life Without, oh, CCWP, the California Coalition Women Prisoners. I mean, there's so many curves. Yeah. Citizens <clears throat> United to... Uh, Responsible budget. Yeah. You know, there's so many different groups that will educate, that will you know, they're always accepted. They're, you're, they're, op they're open for new people. And the more people they can get, the more people they can educate. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I started just as a volunteer, you know, and just, I'm like, find a local organization. There's organizations that are doing the support work in every, in every state, you know, we're California based, but we're in contact with people across the country because it's such um, a horrible, horrible blight. We have the, you know, our incarceration rate is is at the top of the list, you know, and we we think of ourselves as a civilized, you know, Christian nation, but we we're really turning our backs on people. So, you know, I think that there's there's with a little bit of work, you can just find your local organization, and and we all need we need all the help we can get. And and I also feel like as someone who was not impacted by incarceration, and my family or myself, like I've gained so much from being part of this community. I love these yeah. people. Like Lauren said, it's a family, um, mm -hmm. have a lot of fun, you know. There's and there's her smile again, <laughs> Lauren's smile. <laughs> it just beams, Lauren, it's beautiful. Um, people you. who wanna purchase the pottery, and I know that we have some photos of it. So um, let's take a look at that. How can we um, purchase some of this beautiful work that you all do there? Um, how can we get a hold of that? So on our website, peoplespotteryproject.com, you can wow. buy it directly from us and the funds, you know, we also have um, a, a fiscal sponsor, Fulcrum Arts, um, and so we're a nonprofit as well as selling our pottery. So you can make donations on our website and you can buy the pottery or both. We also have really cool t-shirts. <laughs> you know, this is such a hard time and um, I have visited prisons on multiple occasions as a reporter. And my heart just would sink when I would see some of the women there and I could just look into their eyes and I could, I could almost feel them a little bit, knowing that some of them may have been um, not in there for, for the reasons that they were accused of. So, you know, everybody needs a hand. So I guess what I'm saying is, if you can, donate. Donate to the People's Pottery Project. You guys are doing great things for the Thank people you. who are out, who are really trying to turn their lives around, who are turning their lives around from what you're doing. Um, I applaud you, Susan, and I applaud you, Lauren, for all you've been through. I couldn't imagine, I just couldn't. And of course, Molly, uh, <laughs> for the People's Pottery Project. I thank you, all three of you. Uh, you. Any final thank words, you. please, that you'd like to say? Thank you for your, 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 your heartfelt support. Yeah, I mean it, yeah. Thank you, it's, it's important to get the word out. Yeah, yeah. So I donate. Wanna, uh, oh, Lauren, please. I just, I just want to thank everybody for listening and supporting us. And just just thank you. Thank you all. Now, we can all go there as well and make pottery, can we, um, when we're able to? Yeah, great, great, great question. So, um, yeah, we part of what we're going to do once the pandemic allows um, we hold classes for people in the community who, and you can pay and take a class and Lauren or, or one of our other members will show you how to build, build the bowls that we make and work on the wheel. And it's really fun. 
Um, we have some pictures on the website of, of some of the family get togethers, you know, little kids and it's really fun. I want you to know I have wanted to do that my entire life. So we're <laughs> going to do that. Okay. You guys, and the minute you're open, will you text me? Don't email me. Just text me and say, Deborah, we're open. That would be so fun if I could show up and, yeah, and yeah. Lauren or Susan could show me what to do. I'm sure it'll, I'm sure my bowl will look like a tree, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's really okay. Okay, everybody, thank you, you so much. <laughs> yeah, I believe it, right? Just got to put your mind to it. Um, so peoplespotteryproject.com. Uh, I appreciate the three of you joining me today. I really enjoyed it. Lauren Fuller, uh, Susan Bustamante, and uh, Molly Larkey, uh, People's Pottery Project. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Um, you're actually all a lot of fun. You've been through an awful mm -hmm. lot in your lives. And um, <laughs> it's all about the community, right, Molly? Yes. All about the community. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today on Deborah Cobalt Live. You can see this show on um, YouTube, on Facebook, on our IGTV, and then we pivot and we put it out there as an audio podcast. So you can find us anywhere you get a podcast on Apple, on um, Spotify, on Amazon, on iHeart. So just look up Deborah Cobalt Live, People's Pottery Project, and you'll find our show. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. I appreciate it. Please stay healthy out there. 